Welcome to the virtue of chastity. The first time I heard chastity, I was a senior in high school, and all my classmates in 1976 were getting ready for a senior trip from a suburb of Columbus, Ohio to Washington, D.C. And somehow, a friend told me that our mutual friend was equipped with a chastity belt. <laughs> and that's the first time I heard the name word chastity. And I asked some further questions and then, oh, figured it out. But her parents were wanting to make sure on this crazy trip to Washington, D.C. that nothing would happen. That was, I'm not going to talk this evening about chastity belts, but about chastity as a virtue. And you have notes there, and I believe it all begins with the Trinity. One of my friends, Ted, said today, Jerry, everything begins with the Trinity. That's true. But I love in, in John 17, as Jesus is praying, and he's, he's saying that, Father, may all of them be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. John 17, 21 and 22. May they also be in us so that the world may, be, may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. He's really praying for, for us, the people, those who are following him and would following, follow him, that they might be one. But we see here that the Father and Jesus are absolutely one. The Trinity is absolutely one, inseparable, um, united and undivided, one. And it's interesting, it's lovely to see in the scriptures that Jesus is always trying to glorify the Father. Actually, John 17 is, is saying that I want to glorify you, Father. I want to glorify you. The Holy Spirit wants to glorify Jesus and glorify the Father one after another. This three-person God is the best picture of chastity that I can think of. And then, in Genesis 1, 127, God, this God, this God, Trinitarian God, created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them, John 1, 27. Wow, what? We're created in his image, in his likeness. This three-person God tied together in chesed or agape love. And we're in that, in that same kind of material, <laughs> if you will. That same kind of, we're invited into that same kind of relationship Wow, it's going to take me forever to recover from that. It's so beautiful. So I think that's why we see, we see God describing himself in Exodus 20, that you will have no other gods before me. Uh, why is that? Why? He's a jealous God. What does that mean, that he's a jealous God? He has to be the only one. Be the only one. I like that. If he has to be the only one. So he follows that. You will have not make for yourself any image, an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. For I, the Lord, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. God. Why does he have to be so jealous? He created us for himself. 
He created us for himself, yes. Last week, as Josh alluded, um, I was off in uh, Southern California, Los Angeles. And um, I felt some jealousy for my wife, and I think she felt some jealousy for me. And I mean, it took me two days to get home to her, but finally got home and we are reunited. But uh, we may be physically apart, but she doesn't want to even imagine that I'm doing something behind her back in Los Angeles, or she's behind my back here in Wilmore, Kentucky. That healthy jealousy, that is because God is a jealous God. When the Father sent Jesus here, he was jealous for him. Would, would Jesus do anything to disappoint his father? Well, at one point he's praying in the garden, no, don't, I don't want to go through with this. No, I don't want to. Take this cup from me. But he finally said, okay, not my will, but your will be done. There's unity, absolute unity there. And this is in context of many gods, a, a culture of many gods. In Egypt alone, there were 2,000 gods and goddesses named in Egypt. Jan and I had the privilege of going through Cairo, through their main museum, and pointed out different images of, of Greek gods. Egy sorry, Egyptian gods. Um, so God's jealous. I made you for me. And I'm, I'm your God. And you are my people. Got that clear? But um, one problem that, that God made, well, it wasn't a problem, but I wouldn't have done it this way, but God created all of us with freedom. I would not have done that. If I were God, I would have created robots that would say, yes, God, I follow you. I will do whatever you say, yes. But he created us with freedom. <sighs> freedom to reject him, freedom to embrace him. And uh, there's the danger and there's the beauty because, um, like Dennis Kinlaw would say to me, Jerry, you know, there's no love without freedom, and there's no freedom without love. So in freedom, we have that choice to love God, and God has that choice to love us. Um, I think... I think God can do anything except one thing, and that's to make me love him. He can't make me, because then it wouldn't be love. It would be slavery and force. So what is chastity and what does all that have to do with chastity? Well, I think um, Exodus 20 helps describe chastity, as we've already read in verses 3 and 4. No other gods before me. This is an exclusive relationship. No image besides me. Um, and then he extrapolates that to, that's, that's vertical relationship. And then in horizontal relationships, uh, don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, no false testimony against your neighbor, and do not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife 
or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So why? Because of that exclusive relationship that God arranged that we call, we call marriage. We call honoring one another. We call a, an exclusive commitment. So Aquinas, he said, um, def definition of chastity, it's united with God. And I add, and God alone. So chastity might be united with God and God alone, or what I uh, like to say here is, I am purely yours. You are purely mine. I see that as chastity. Um, Biola University, I took this off the internet that they define, chastity is not teeth gritting ability to avoid violating the sexual rules, like a chastity belt helps with it. Rather, chastity is a habit of reverence for oneself and others that enables us to use our sexual powers intelligently in the pursuit of human flourishing and happiness. So, uh, God created us, male and female, and asked us to be united, male and female, together. Genesis 2, 22 to 24, I love this, this picture. Um, in Genesis 2, 22, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Okay, I'd like you to uh, join me in this illustration. Will you please put your hands up, please? Okay, and uh, put them together. This is one, Adam, one, now apart, two, he separated Adam. Don Joy used to call it the splitting of the atoms. <laughs> and then comes back together as one. That's the picture I see in Genesis 2, 22 to 24, that exclusive. You know, male and female in Hebrew mean ish and isha, which are really two parts of a whole. So I have, we are whole here. Jan is here. I'm here. We are a whole together. And that is exclusive. Why would something come in there and distort that oneness or that exclusivity. And yeah, Dennis Kinlow and I would, you would talk about that marriage is probably the purest earthly form of example of the Trinity, of who God is. Marriage. Exclusive relationship. That's what God wants. He wants that exclusive relationship. I'm your God. You're my people. I want Jan to know, I'm your husband. You're my wife. That's it. Not by force, but out of love. That's what I see in definition. Um, comments? Questions? Can we go back to the matter of God's jealousy for a moment? Okay, God's jealousy. Uh, 
thing that God's jealousy is for his name. His name? In other words, that his, his character be recognized for what it is. So when he declares, when he says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, he's wanting us to acknowledge his character because only as we acknowledge his character can he do in us and for us what huh. he wants to do. Good. Otherwise, we're off on our own. Right. Yeah, acknowledge his character, only then can he do in us what he wants to do, right? That's good. Another comment, question? Okay, we're going to keep going then. Contrasts to chastity. You with me on the notes? Um, here's a quote from John Wesley. This is interesting. I haven't seen this quote before, but he is saying, Indeed, where is male chastity to be found? Among the nobility, among the gentry, among the tradesmen, or among the common people of England? How few lay any claim to it at all. How few desire so much as the reputation of it. Would you yourself account it an honor or a reproach to be ranked among those of whom it is said, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. And how numerous are they now, even among such as even among such as are accounted men of honor and probity, who are fed as, they are as fed horses, everyone neighing after his neighbor's wife. Whew. Yeah, that's 18th century, right? Did you have a comment? No, okay, yeah. But that's, that's pretty sad. It's, it's very sad. Actually, let me, um, let me point to the last part, the place of chastity today, point, the first point under there. That book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman, I highly recommend that book because it traces where we are today back through decades and centuries to get where we are today. So some of this that John Wesley is pointing out in his culture has evolved into where we are today in our culture. The last 10 years did not happen just the last 10 years in that environment. It happened out of the 60s, the 70s, I mean, We've seen a lot, haven't we, in our lifetime? And now we think, oh, where has the world gone? So, yeah, trying now to redefine marriage. I think, I think most of you know our friend uh, Tim Philpot, who was an uh, attorney up here in Lexington and then a family court judge. And he said in the last few years, they started trying to define marriage, judges and lawyers did. And he said it just took paper, reams of paper, to try to define marriage. He said before that, it never had to be defined. It has never historically had to be defined. That's interesting. Even in law, it was never defined but now they're trying to define what marriage is. One thing that I personally choose to do, and this happened just uh, last week, that some people were referring to gay marriage, and I would push back on that because I don't believe there is gay marriage. It's a, it, you can't have dry water. So uh, I say, okay, there could be a gay union, That'd be fine. I mean, that's, that's a union, yes. But marriage, no. 
marriage, as we see in Genesis 2, is a male and a female. Um, so that's one way I push back in our culture. Jan? I'm not sure that would be fine, the same to call it that. Yes. It's more acceptable in your mind than to call it. To call it, that's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, yeah, and defining what, what uh, gender means. Um, on some of my applications and uh, checking in at the uh, doctor's office, you know, some are male or female, but others are, you know, there are about six choices and more of what I choose as my gender. I thought <laughs> Jan brought up a funny point that she, um, she found where there was a, uh, a place where, who had a farm that had cattle and they'd go through a skinny place and they'd have some barbed wire in that skinny place. And then the farmers could take blood samples and just test how the, the cattle are doing. And of course, they can always tell if it's a male or female. But it's interesting that in today's world, you can't test if a ma person is male or female with blood. I mean, you can, but uh, it's up to how a person feels. It's, it's relative. In preparation for this evening, I did a little Google search on sexual freedom. And I decided not to bring any material here. <laughs> I'll tell you one video of a man who owned a bar in Nashville, Tennessee. And he says, you know, in his environment, he encourages any kind of freedom, any kind of exploration you want. That's what he personally does. And that's what he encourages anyone who comes to their place. It's uh, freely explored and encouraged. Uh, I had a, a friend in high school. He was a bit older than me. And uh, speaking of jealousy, I was a little jealous of him because he had a dune buggy. You know what a dune buggy was, at least in this 60s, 70s, you know, you take the Volkswagen Beetle and put a fiberglass top on it and a roll bar. And, and you know, in the parade, he always carried the cheerleaders. So he lo later told me, you know, Jerry, I can get any girl in bed with me. Any girl. Says, it doesn't matter if she's a churchgoer or not. Doesn't matter. I can. I can get anyone. Oh. That was in the seventies. Um. Yeah. Chastity. Well, I think uh, Josh, you covered lust last week, right? So we don't have to go deep into that, but. But. The contrast is helpful to see the, the, the point of chastity. I want to live in relationships that are filled with chastity, don't you? With exclusive, honorable relationships. And God, his whole design, his whole being, is all about chastity within the Trinity, his creative persons, and in marriage, in relationships, wants chastity. As I was praying about this today, I, I see chastity as, as part of the heart of God, his very heart. He wants those pure relationships God is a relational God, and he wants to see, he, he lives in purity in those pure relationships, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He wants us to be invited into and live 
in those pure relationships, starting with himself and continuing in marriage and family. It's beautiful. And I think it's a key issue in our culture today. Jesus doesn't want to hear that it's, oh, I'm all for you, but I have these other interests, these other things besides you, Jesus, these other gods, these other idols. So biblical examples of chastity. I've, we've, we've talked about Genesis 2, 22, 24. Um, I'm going to skip to, to Acts 15. You know, they had a, a big issue, the, the apostles did, as they started reaching the Gentiles. So they had this big council at Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they said, what are we going to do? They're, do we make all these Gentiles do everything the Jews are doing? Or what should we, what should we say? And they, they debated it. And verse 19 of chapter 15, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat, strangled, meat of strangled animals, and from blood. So it's interesting. That's what they wrote, verse 24 on, or actually verse 23 on. That letter to there, verse 29, you are to abstain from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. And I see that as first relationship vertically. God wants them to be pure vertically and in, um, don't want to have food sacrificed to idols. No. Um, let's, let's not confuse that. Let's not go there to idols. And then secondly, from sexual immorality, immora purity among one another, especially honoring husband and wife. I think that's interesting, the vertical and the horizontal. Okay, Ephesians 5, 1 through 7. I at first thought it would be best just to read verse 3, but as I read this, this passage, it's really 1 through 7 are all about chastity. Um, Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 7, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Wow. Uh, just that one verse, those two verses, I mean, are so beautiful. Do you see the exclusivity there? Do you see the sacrifice? Do you see Jesus is absolutely giving all for us? Verse 3, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a person as an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. So, again, verse 5. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, back to Exodus 20, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You see how jealous God is? He wants us so to be united with him in absolute purity. Um, my wife, Jan, is a wonderful cook. And she doesn't want me spoiling her cooking by throwing things in that would spoil it. <laughs> and it's for her good and my good, and God's the same way. He doesn't want us to spoil the batch for you, for us. Um, but... Um, Le Leviticus 19, why do I pick this as a picture of chastity? Well, first of all, it, it has, um, it starts with what used to be my least favorite verse in the whole Bible. And that's Leviticus 19 too. I just did not like this verse. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And as a kid, I pictured God standing way up high and saying, Jerry Coleman, be holy because I am holy. And I'm way down there among the dirt, and God's way up there, and I'm trying to climb up that ladder, trying to clean up myself, trying to get good enough to be accepted and never getting there. That's how I felt. And I felt the shame of trying to climb that ladder and falling down and never measuring up. But I don't know why it wasn't until I was nearly 30 years old that I saw Leviticus 20, 21, and 22, where we see seven times, I am the Lord who makes you holy. <laughs> wow. So I don't have to do it all by myself. Like you were saying, Mark, that God's character, he wants his character in us. That's John 17 as well. In us, and I am the Lord who makes you holy. So God not only shows who he is and invites us into that relationship, he says, I will equip you. I will give you the fuel. I will give you part of myself. I will give you the Holy Spirit to live in you to be connected with me and be as I am. So I, I list here all those verses in these three chapters. I am the Lord who makes them holy. I am the Lord who makes you holy. I am the Lord who makes them holy. I am the Lord who makes you holy. I am the Lord who makes you holy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. That's chastity at its best. Uh, okay. Um, question, comment? Right. Yes. Yeah, you're saying you you see it as all of life and not just sexual purity, but all of life. Yeah. Okay. So the place of chastity today. As I mentioned, um, I really recommend this, this book by Carl Truman. And during the, uh, the recent Asbury outpouring, 
Carl Truman was here to speak in chapel at Asbury University. And uh, he was uh, instead taken to a smaller venue on campus and had a, a small group talking about his book on the rise and triumph of the mo modern self. And I think, Jane, did you say he went on to speak in Lexington too at a venue or two up there? Uh huh. So, I, I highly recommend that. And chastity does not begin with a person's feeling or popular consensus. Um, but it goes with the, as other says, or says, the. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. As I. Uh, as I research sexual freedom, oh boy, uh, just, you know, the door's wide open. It's just up to you. And I don't, I, I wouldn't want to be in a relationship where I knew my spouse was doing other, having other relationships, intimate relationships. Would you? Would God? But chastity begins and ends with God's beautiful plan and gift. God has given us something beautiful. First, it's himself, his very self he's given us through Jesus and the Holy Spirit in us. John 17, again and again, God in us exclusively, and us in him. I mean, actually uses that word in several times in John 17, that we can be in God and God in us. How intimate can it be? No more, no more intimate than that. And he gives us a gift of marriage of earthly marriage as a model here on earth of intimacy, of unity, of exclusivity, and of chastity. I love it. We have a gift. Let's not waste it. Well, you say, uh, Jerry, don't worry, I'm, I'm old. <laughs> um, well, one, one old person said, you know, sexual temptation gets harder for me as I grow older. And this person was uh, older than I, and I'm really old. Well, 65 this year, that's pretty old, right? But um, we can all be tempted. We can all be tempted. Okay, be careful. Say that again, be careful. Be careful. Say you think you stand. Think you stand, lest you fall, right? Yeah. Um, Right. Yeah, if you think about it. Yeah, if you do it in your mind. Yeah. Um, Don Joy used to, uh, he, he coached us on what, what that would look like, a sexual sin would look like. He, and he said, okay, we could be tempted, but it can move into sin, he said, when you entertain in your mind, oh, if I had the opportunity, I would do this. If I had the opportunity, I would do it with this person or that or whatever. So, um, we have a beautiful plan. God has given us a beautiful, beautiful plan. 
and he's equipped us to, to live it. Um, and that's why I include Leviticus and why I include John 17, because God is equipping us. I am the God who makes you holy. I'm the God who sends you Jesus and the Holy Spirit to live in you. It's the fruit of the Spirit. John, seven, John 15, the vine and the branches. I'm connected to the vine and that sap of the Holy Spirit flows through Jesus into me that I can be all that he has created me to be. Hallelujah. He's equipped us. So am I going to try harder or am I going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? I, if I try harder, it's, it's my work. If I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit, it's his work in me. Um, so that's what I have to say about chastity. It all begins with, with God. It all begins with the Trinity, and it ends with the Trinity. Yet the Trinity himself invites us to be in and among the intimate circle of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want that exclusive, intimate relationship with him? that we can say there is no other. You are, you are God for me. I am all in for you, God. When I was uh, standing there in uh, 1978 in front, in the front of a church in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and my knees were knocking and my palms were sweaty and hearing the music play at my wedding, and uh, just waiting for Jan to come down with uh, her arm and her dad's arm and giving her to me. And I'd waited all my 20 years for this moment. And uh, I wanted her to know, Jan, there's no other. Because when I met her at, um, at freshman orientation, Greenville College, I had a girlfriend back home. And, um, but then I met Jan in freshman orientation, and I wanted her, my parents to, to get to know her a bit. So we got into a phone booth. I'm, you all know what a phone booth is, except maybe Josh. <laughs> <laughs> so... We got in a phone booth and called my parents collect and my mom answered and she said, I'm so glad you called. We're having a good bar party for your girlfriend. <laughs> and so she got on the phone and Jan left the phone booth and she said, well, why aren't your letters the same? What's, what's going on? And uh, I had a shallow and short chat and I had to figure something out here. <laughs> yeah, we're laughing, but it, it describes um, what chastity is not. So I quickly resolved that. <laughs> and when I stood up there, uh, for my wedding, uh, Jan knew there's no other. There's no other behind, beside, no temptation, nothing. I'm all for you. And I had to know when she's walking to me that there's no one else back there, no one else she's thinking about. I know she had a boyfriend or two, and she knew I had a girlfriend or two, but it's over. All for you. And that's how it's been for 
Now, uh, this year we'll celebrate 45 years. Hallelujah. <laughs> and that's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, it's freeing. It's loving. It's, it's not easy all the time. But it's wonderful. And <laughs> that's what God wants. He wants us to say, stand there before him and look directly at God and say, there's no other, nothing tempting me this way or that way. I'm all yours. And he's saying to us, I'm all yours. That's a picture of chastity. Amen? Well, Father, uh, thank you. Thank you that you are so chaste and that you love us so that you would sacrifice anything for us. Father, uh, thank you for the invitation you have given us to be in you and exclusively yours and your people. Um, we pray against any temptation that would keep us away from you and keep us from loving you with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our souls. And Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for the gift of, of exclusive relationships, and the gift of family. Father, thank you that you even equip us with the Holy Spirit to live, to walk with you and in you and give us everything we need. Father, uh, continue to teach us and continue to protect us from evil because we are yours and you are ours. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you.